right. Hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Ron Real, who is up in Seattle. How are you doing, Ron? I'm doing fine. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to speak with you. And Ron is the CEO of the High Road Institute, uh, which is a great name. And so what we're going to talk about today is the idea of leading from the high road, and especially within the context of how leading from the high road for sales and marketing is going to help us as we emerge from this unfortunate and dark period that we're in today. So let's baseline it a little, uh, Ron. When you talk about leading from the high road, what do you mean? Well, let me ask you this question. If when you hear somebody say that expression, what what comes to mind? What you, what usually are the, some of the first uh, reactions you have to it? Well, when you talk, when you say uh, taking the high road, it's you normally are talking about uh, taking a more elevated kind of moral, ethical standpoint. Yes, that's very common. Uh, ethical is really a key part of it, because in today's world, we need people to make not only ethical decisions but also decisions that that I say from the high road, because taking the high road is more than just uh, being, uh, being ethical, uh, being straight. Uh, it's also about the greater good. It's also about making mm -hmm. sure that you consider the impact of your decisions, not just for today, but also for tomorrow. And, and uh, there's some decision makers who tend to just focus on this quarter's earnings or this quarter's sales or this quarter's profits and forget about what their decisions today what impact they might be having six months from now, two years from now, or even 10 years from now. Well, I think I mean, it's in part of that we've become a very, very narrowly or short-term focused um, society in general. I mean, I talked today, I think we're, we're the shortcut, shortcut culture. Every, you know, there's, everybody thinks that there's an easy, short way to do everything. And we've become very, as I said, short-term focused. So looking at the longer term impacts of things you do is kind of not in vogue at the moment, but it's it's essential. Well, and we'll see it, it just played out in today's news, the, mm -hmm. the tug, tug of war between keeping people safe at home and maybe going into June and July and August, and yet uh, the need for businesses to have employees to start not only generating sales, but to keep the, the doors going, things like that. So we're, we're seeing this this uh, tug of war, and that's a typical situation where taking the high road would make a difference if we started the conversation and the discussion and the plans. Hey, what's the high road of this? How can we all win from the situation? The plans that would come out would be much much better off, much uh, better thought out, and more importantly, we'd probably have less issues and concerns going forward. So, uh, as people start to plan for for coming out of a planning. Uh, their sales and marketing strategies or approach. I mean, what are some of the things that you would encourage leaders to look at and how should you lead your people through this? Uh, one thing the high road leader does is, is tries as, as best they can to operate from a consensus. Now, there's no perfect consensus. Mm -hmm. But for instance, if you have four or five different stakeholders in your business, or uh, let's say you're planning a, a conference and you have all these different parties that you want represented, it would be important to get the issues out on the table first and try to figure out, okay, what are going to be the sticking points? What will be the, the concerns? What will be the points of, uh, of the, that if you, if you mention them, suddenly anger and, and despair would pop out. It's, it's good to get those out in the open. So then finally, when we come to the table to make an agreement, whether it's on the future of the company, the, the future of the, the nation, just the future of the school, it'd be important to have those discussions. And then we can deal more with reality. Because when a leader, whether it's an individual leader or a leadership team, is dealing with or making decisions based on their biases or based on their, their, their gut feelings rather than asking questions and finding out what are their bigger issues, then if we don't have that, then chances are it will, will not be a high road decision or a high road outcome. And let's face it, I mean, right now, uh, it's one of the things that you've got to consider is, is not making decisions based on emotion. And, um, and especially at times of stress, when people are stressed out, and even if you bring them together, how do you get the best, how do you get the best thinking out of people? And how do you have them look at things from a maybe a slightly less emotional perspective? 
that's where a professional facilitator really makes a difference. When you have to make some key decisions, you want somebody that's totally independent of the situation and can ask the questions that no one wants asked, raise the points that no one wants raised, but also notice that when emotions are starting to take over the discussion or someone is getting stuck because of their uh, personal beliefs or biases, to immediately call, call the group on it and then find a path to either go around it, to go through it, or to find a way to deal with it so that it goes towards a final solution. And I, I find that, um, especially in uh, larger organizations and smaller organizations, uh, you will see that when uh, the CEO or uh, the senior leader of the company wants to have that type of discussion, they're the facilitator. And that's the wrong person to have it because, again, they want an outcome, whether it's to get the business going or to increase sales by 5% or whatever that is. They, without knowing it, they might be pushing people in that direction and get the, get, they may get the consensus that they believe they have, but mm -hmm. it's not going to happen. It's not a realistic uh, path. Yeah, and and I think that's a fair point, and I think yeah, there's there is a there is a tendency to do that, and I've probably been guilty of it myself in the past of making myself the facilitator. <laughs> uh, 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 but there's another part too, isn't it, when you bring people together, especially in in a time of of crisis like this, that it, it can be difficult to get people to think outside of their own maybe a span of control or their own department and they start to go into protective mode as opposed to thinking collaboratively about how we can, what's the best way forward? They start to think, okay, how can I best protect my patch and my people? And one of the traits of a high road leader is a person is compassionate. They're willing to, they will understand that people are going to have feelings and emotions and things that they're concerned about. And that's, it's important to have those discussions beforehand. You've probably heard the phrase difficult conversations. Mm -hmm. I a leader is not afraid of the difficult conversation to explore that. For instance, just coming out of this, the, not only the, 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 the recession, but also the uh, epidemic is that there's going to be major trauma. Uh, I foresee uh, people who were maybe borderline um, introverts suddenly going uh, full-blown introverts. They don't want to come out of their houses. Uh, avoiding meetings, avoiding going out in, in traffic. I see organizations that had a promising future suddenly can't figure out how to, uh, how to get the people uh, behind the vision that they might have had four, five, six months ago. So that's where the compassion comes in. And part of the role of the leader is if he or she feels that they don't have that ability to to have that heart to heart conversation with the people involved, their employees, let's say, or maybe their vendors or or uh, investors, mm -hmm. uh, then that's where you bring in somebody who can can open up those conversations. But yeah, I, I foresee just a tremendous amount of trauma, both on a personal basis and societal basis and a business basis as we get out of this, because it's not going to be like turning off and on a light switch. You know, it's been off now and suddenly May 8th is going to be turned on. No, we've got a lot of issues to deal with. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. And and I think sometimes, though, people confuse compassion maybe with indulgence, but you're not saying that you necessarily are going to indulge everybody. You treat them with compassion, but you may, as you said, may have to have difficult conversations with them and, and say to people, listen, this is what the company needs to do. This is what we need to do. And I absolutely respect your concerns and all of that. But we've all come together and this is the way we've got to go. You got to get on board. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, that could happen. Uh, uh, probably the best definition I've heard of compassion is not making a judgment. Mm -hmm. So let's say we're friends and I expect you to support me. And for some reason you're not able to support me. I could immediately go into anger mode and start blaming you and get really upset. That's not compassion. Compassion is just the understanding what happened. And then, even if maybe you forgot or you just felt you couldn't do it, I understand it, and yet we will move on past that. It's, it's always, if we get past the issue and go into something that's productive, something that's beneficial, then that shows that compassion was there. Yeah, and, and so uh, is this a time, do you think, where, I mean, is this a good time, do you think, for, for people to reshape maybe the culture of their organization? Maybe now this is a time... Uh, 
you know, business has been good. And as we know, when times are good, you kind of push a lot of things to the side or you say, okay, it's not broke. I ain't going to fix it. Right. Things are going well. Now is a great time that when we, everything has been called to a halt to actually re-examine the, the culture, the, the, the direction of your company, how you want your company to evolve. It's the perfect time for it. It's up to the leader to shape their culture. And because of the, the, a lot of what's happened in the last couple, let's say the last month or so, has been out of our control, to starting to shape the culture in the way that you want it to be is taking control. And it could be simple as, for instance, maybe not all the employees want to come to the office 40 hours a week. Maybe they found that they are much more productive at home. Uh, maybe they they found that they need to spend more time with their families, but they can work evenings as opposed to the daytime. The, the, those are some examples. Uh, but I think that the shape of the culture is really important. And companies that that have a culture where they don't care, meaning that employees are simply numbers uh, and they're just statistics, they will, will not be around because employees, um, once they realize that there was no compassion for what they, they experienced over the last 60 days, will just leave. Even if they don't have a job, it's a lot less painful to leave a toxic culture than it is to face uh, unemployment. And those, it's more painful. So they would mm. rather uh, figure out where they can go to. And what I'm finding in terms of the creativity that's happening out there as a result of uh, this uh, this epidemic and the reaction to it, there's a tremendous amount of opportunities and creativity that are being generated. And so I see suddenly new business models, uh, new ways of making money to, to, to help and also giving back in terms of being able to just make, uh, make some, some sol yeah. great solutions and get paid for yeah. it. And, and exactly. And we've seen that even during, we've seen during the crisis where companies have been able to pivot and start to contribute to the, to the, the crisis, you know, so making masks and like going over and making ventilators, all of that. So as we come out of it, there's great opportunities for people to do other things. I think just coming back to a point you made, I think this is the, the best time for organizations, if your business lends itself to it, is to rethink this whole idea of forcing people to come into buildings, forcing people to live within a radius of where you're physically located and start to look at um, allowing, you know, getting the talent where the talent is, allowing people to live and work where they would live, where they would like, where the cost of living, as you said, you know, be there to, you know, send your kids off to school, be there to be able to have dinner with them in the evening, whatever it is, or whatever kind of lifestyle you want. Uh, I think if your business lends itself to it, you should be really thinking about not this as a temporary thing, but as maybe you want to look at allowing remote working more and more for your people to give them the best lifestyle they have. And I guarantee you, because we've seen it with our own company, you'll get huge reward back. I agree. I see a parallel with, with education. For instance, mm -hmm. colleges are realizing that they don't necessarily have to have the students in the classroom in order to give not only deliver the information, but also give tests. Uh, so colleges may say, all right, uh, let's go to more online learning. Meanwhile, the students are getting upset saying we're paying hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. We expect it to be a professor. I can have one-on-one -on -one with a professor. I can be in the classroom in discussion. So we're going to see a clash of those two cultures uh, in education going forward, not only at the university level, but I also see probably at the high school level as well. Mm -hmm. No, I, I couldn't agree more. And that's why I just think is now is the time, as you said, if you're if you're going to take a high road leader approach is to be a little bit more bold in in your vision. You're never going to probably get a better chance than this to be to be bold and to reshape the structure and the future of your company and look at how can you how can you build a company culture that gets the best out of people, but also provides them with the best environment. And, and that's a, a balance, a delicate balance, mm -hmm. because at any what, what particular time, a company will go too far in this direction and yeah. too far in that direction. But the high road leader has, has a, a sense of awareness, noticing when it's out of balance. If the direction or the culture of the organization is going to look like X, Y, Z, and it's not getting there, what, as a, as a leader and my leadership team, we need to do to get the culture closer to what it, we'd like it to have. There's no perfect culture, but there are ones that... that that push that help people thrive and then those that push people down and so high road leader works to have that culture that people want to be there they're willing to contribute and do whatever it takes
just like for instance the medical people personnel that are taking care of our uh, the sick the those yeah. in the hospitals well, I think it's always a, a crisis time is, a, is certainly a time that's going to tell you very quickly how much commitment uh, your people have. And so if it turns out that your your people don't have the same commitment or whatever that you would like them to, maybe you have to ask yourself, uh, you know, about your own leadership. Right? Yes, that's true. Let me give you an example of a. Uh, you had, we were talking about the high road leader. The high road leader balances the, the need to take risks, which coming down to the recession would to be very aggressive in terms of making sales and looking for new customers, mm -hmm. but at the same time also be uh, concerned about taking risks that are too much in terms of maybe not being able to have a, that's a sustainable growth or uh, having the, the same uh, customer base, client base that you had before, because maybe it's no longer profitable. Maybe having fewer clients that pay you more is a lot mm -hmm. better business model than having lots of clients that pay you very little. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think everything is. Uh, I think if you're if you're smart right now as as a leader as a, as the leadership team, you you are looking at uh, you're looking at everything right now rather than just uh, looking at okay when can when can we go back to the status quo? I think now you got to look at when how can we use this terrible time to evolve. Yes, and there's gonna be some temptations for leaders uh, to not take the high road. If I can give you an example, I just heard this morning in the business uh, broadcast here in Seattle about Boeing. Of course, they're not only a major employer here, but mm -hmm. they're synonymous with the city of Seattle. Uh, Boeing right now has orders for 500 planes, so they have a backlog of 500. Uh, so my guess is, they're going to do everything they can to hold on to those those orders, which as a shareholder, as a mm -hmm. as an employee, I'd want them to. But think about the pressures if suddenly the airlines, which also announced today that they're going to uh, cancel some of those orders, they're not going to pay for some of those. And so maybe that backlog uh, realistically is, uh, let's say, cutting half at 250. I'm just throwing out some numbers. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, the tension on management and the board of directors is to keep those 500 orders on the book. The high road thing is no, if we're only going to be able to deliver in the next uh, say 18 months, 250 planes, then that should be on that. Uh, and another statistic is uh, for Boeing, for every dollar they spend that goes into a jet, 70% seven, uh, of that goes to the suppliers. Uh, and you're a businessman, so there's two ways to generate a profit. What are, what mm -hmm. are those? Oh, to, to generate a profit. Well, I mean, the way to generate a profit is to produce something that people want and sell it at the and and be able to sell it at the highest price and produce it at the lowest cost. Exactly. So there's two two pressures there. So let me continue the Boeing analogy. Now I'm not saying they're doing this. I'm just using it because I just heard about them this morning. Okay. So coming out of this recession, they need to keep their share price up, keep their shareholders happy, uh, also make sure that they uh, can compete with. Uh, the, the competitors and Airbus as, as well as mm -hmm. uh, supply the airlines. Okay, so they could come out of this recession and immediately put the squeeze on the suppliers and try to get down that down to, to, to $6. But think about the impact on the suppliers and people in the supply chain, on their employees, on their bottom line. Or they could try to inf uh, it put, push, as uh, Wells Fargo did, push their people to make sales to generate a fake income so that they suddenly on paper they can report to the SEC and to the and to the shareholders that they made all this this money. This coming out of this is just right for people to not take the high road, but just to do what they need to do in order to say, you know, we're we're surviving. We've got to be here. But there's all this temptation to make some decisions that will impact them for a long time. And they're not the high road choice. Yeah. So I, as we said, I think you, I think so. I think the good thing is you have choices coming out of this. You can take the high road or you can take the other road. And uh, obviously, we'd encourage people to take the high road and to just to take a good hard look at everything and use this as an opportunity. So uh, as we're coming to the end, Ron, all of Ron's information will be in his contributor bio links to uh, to his company and everything he does. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself and what you do. Well, I ended up as a professional speaker, which is very unusual because my background, I started out as a CPA, which in case you didn't know, stands for constant pain and mm -hmm. 
a wallet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, but I, I realized in, in uh, my training in finance, uh, I understood how business worked. And the most key component that was often overlooked is the people. So people are the most important. So when I became a professional presenter back in, in uh, 1988 and started my firm in 1993, I've always... Uh, uh, made an emphasis that people are the most important part of any business. And if you take good care of your people, they will take good care of you. And there's been some great success stories and uh, horror stories about that. And so what I was looking for, what is it that I really stand for as a leader, as a mm -hmm. leader, coach and trainer and speaker, what's most critical. And it turned out to be taking the high road in everything. And of course, it's not always easy to take the high road. It's the path less travel uh, sure. but, uh, that's been gone into my the books that i published and uh, my presentations and webinars virtual presentations is that people are very important and uh, that's where again my definition of the high road leader you notice that compassion was a very key, mm -hmm. key aspect of it as well as going for the greater good rather than just what's good for me or for my company as well yeah, listen, that's fantastic. Uh, well, yeah. listen, it's been a it's been a pleasure um, speaking with you today. Thank you very uh, much. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM. I'll see you all for another expert interview really soon. Yeah.